Bathurst is the one thing which motivates me and probably the, the teams that I've been involved with. The 1,000 kilometres at Bathurst uh, is the Melbourne Cup of Motorsport for Australians. The moment I got there, I realised that this was going to be my life's ambition, not to win it once or twice, but as many times as I could. Australia's touring car heroes, the great race at Mount Panorama is the jewel in the motor racing crown. Since Holden made its first official entry in 1969, its cars have won 14 times. As Holden celebrates its silver anniversary as an official Bathurst competitor, Colin Bond begins the story of the only race that matters. If you go back to the to 69, the mechanics actually physically drove the cars from Melbourne to Bathurst on the road. It was only a two day event. You got there, you practiced on the Saturday, raced on the Sunday. You know, if you had a pair of overalls or you thought you were doing good in 69. It was a time when Brill Queen was still a fashion statement as rally ace Bond was joined by newcomer Peter Brock, a then amateur co-driver with veteran Des West. This was the nucleus of the newly formed Holden dealer team under the management of Harry Firth. It was also the first Bathurst outing for the mighty Monaro GTS 350 with four-speed transmission and a potent 5.7 litre V8. With fuel stops expected to play a big part in the final result, they save every ounce by pushing to the start. The rival Falcon GT team included 1967 winner Fred Gibson, Bathurst rookie Alan Moffat and the Gagan brothers Ian and Leo. Smith Datsun is first casualty as it brushes the fence opposite the pits. But considering the size of the field, it's an incident free start. So Brock and Moffat were both rivals and rookies in the 1969 Hardy Ferrado 500, a race famous for other reasons, not least the car crunching first lap pileup, triggered by Bill Brown's upside down Falcon, which flipped just past Skyline. We didn't realise something had happened until we come around for the second lap. And there's an awful lot of cars everywhere. I mean, there are cars upside down and sort of in defences all over the place. And uh, it remained like that, I think, for about 10 laps. And all we seem to be doing is getting faster, going through the very small gap that was left. The factory Holden and Ford survived this catastrophe. 
and the race became a battle between the reliability and consistency of the Monaros and the pace of the Falcons, which had a huge appetite for brakes and tyres. This is where every second counts. A minute lost will take an hour to make up. Leo takes over as his crew, with a little help from Big Brother, changed both offside wheels. Now Digby Cook is leader. regularly around 255 and so far his fastest over the flying eighth is just under 129 miles per hour. Ah! The S350 was the most awesome car in my opinion around in those days and to go to Bathurst which is something else and I was very much overawed. I was very much the kid on the block. Uh, I listened very carefully to everything Harry told me to do. He's, you know, he'd say, look, you know, when you come over the top of the hill, go, uh, and, uh, and, uh. so I had to get my uh, and, uh, and, uh, stuff all organised, you know, my brain, just what it all meant. And uh, if he said, don't use the brakes, I didn't use the brakes. If he said, you know, don't use the gearbox to slow down, I didn't use them to slow down because I didn't know any better. I finished third and did what Harry said. And I think that's what clinched the drive with Holden Dealer team on a full-time basis. Dennis Scruban in trouble at Forest Elbow. It's the only day of the year you can park there, Dennis. Now the Bond Roberts Holden takes over. And though their lead is only a narrow one, it's considerably improved when Fred Gibson brings in his car, which is now second. You can never say you've won here until you have done the 130th lap. We are in front, not by that much, actually, but we think that McPhee has to make another stop. And sure enough, McPhee does fit. Only for five gallons, but enough to put him too far back to catch the Bond Holden as it heads for the checkered flag. The Bond Roberts HDT Monaro won on debut, and 25 years on, this victory surprisingly remains the only Bathurst triumph for the immensely talented Colin Bond. Well, the best moment was obviously winning the race in 69, because we went there not as an underdog so much, but it was the first time you had a chance of having a competitive motor car. And I thought it was pretty easy, actually. I was a bit surprised how easy it was in those days to be running at the front of the field and, of course, win the race. In 1970, the General elected not to engage the Falcon GTHO in a battle of the V8s, instead deciding to race the new Tirana GTR, powered by Holden's faithful straight six with triple carbies. Colin Bond and Peter Brock led the Tirana squad, but apart from Bond's brief lunge past the Moffat and Vos Seaton Falcons, Ford had a winning strategy orchestrated by American team manager Al Turner. It was a very clever move um, to offer a performance alternative to the uh, Falcon GT or the GTHO, I guess, was sort of uh, rearing its head in those years. And uh, they, they said, OK, let's take a totally different tack with a light, nimble, small and hot selling uh, Tirana GDR. And so they made the XU1 version of that, which uh, was uh, a pretty potent little car. But things had to go your way, I reckon, to win the race at Bathurst. While Moffat set himself a victory, Falcon driver Tony Roberts launched his GTHO off Mount Panorama in a spectacular series of flips. Shaken but unhurt, Roberts walked away. Bond makes an unscheduled pit stop. With the Bond and Brock Tiranas slowed by valve problems, Moffat secured his first Bathurst win, a performance that established the transplanted Canadian as an intense professional and the arch rival of all Holden drivers. I was a young driver at the time and uh had always heard of about Bathurst and realized that anybody that was anybody that called themselves a race driver in Australia wanted to participate. But having competed from that very first race, I really saw it as my life's work almost. I wanted to win it at, at all efforts and uh, as many times as possible. And uh, sure, the spot 24 hours is a, is a demanding exercise, as is any 24 hours. But Bathurst is second to none anywhere in the world. The pity is that so many people in Australia 
that could support the event don't, don't seem to understand what a jewel we've got in our hands. Moffat only had to wait 12 months for his second victory, and with John French joining him in a team of Phase 3 Falcon GTHOs, it was an all-forward front row. Moffat powers up Mountain Straight, already out on his own. Moffat set the pattern of the race, and despite the efforts of a straight cardboard carton, there was to be no Bathurst boil over. Marston talks of taking immediate Doug Whitefoot brush with spectacular results. Bond is the first of the fancied entries to strike down. A damaged tyre dropped Bond's Tirana XU1 a lap behind to finish fourth, while the John Newell Falcon, driven by Bill Brown, provided an enduring memory of the 1971 race. This horrifying roll along the fence at McPhilmy Park came after a tyre blowout. Brown escaped with a cut cheek and a black eye. But it was Bathurst glory, not disaster, that had gripped the corporate heavyweights at General Motors Holdens and Ford. Mount Panorama and its production car race had become a battleground for engineering excellence and image building. And the cars are coming out now. It's a wet and dismal scene really, but still a great sense of excitement in the air. This is Bathurst, the only race of its kind in the world. Absolutely unique, and it's certainly run on one of the world's great tracks. All pit crew must clear the grid at the one minute four. All pit crew must clear the grid at the one minute four. 500. Flag should be dropping any moment. Come over the hump in a wall of spray. Moffat, closely followed by French. A slight gap to Brock in the first hold. Then Bond and Moore with their lights on. The Holden dealer team entered two six-pack XU1s, one each for Brock and Bond, who started the wet race on hand-cut racing slicks, only to clip a bank on lap four and roll the Tirana. Bond gone, Holden's post right with Brock and Moore, and they're pushing Moffat hard as he escapes the big bomb and down through the end. Moffat at least will be glad that he's got one of the nimble Tiranas off his In back. a dogfight that was to become familiar over the next ten years, Brock and Moffat battled fiercely. And Brock's got him, slipped through on the run, down to Forest Elbow. Moore's looking for a way past two. The Falcon's definitely slower across the top where it's treacherously slippery. Moffat will pull out the stops down the straight. And look, he's gone. Gibson's wrong. Oh, still going. Hey, look, look uh, I just missed him. God. That was a fearful accident. It was the expatriate Canadian who miscued, beaching his Falcon. He's up a bank at Reed Park, near where Bond went. That's two quick body blows to Ford. Gibson crashes, and now Moffat in trouble. That puts Brock and the Holden Tirana into first place. I will admit Peter had a lucky win in 72. I made a little mistake, but uh, I just didn't, you know, want to make it three in a row. Brakes are just getting better in. Very nice. Here comes Moffat. He's got the boot down in fifth and climbing back. Not even a one-minute penalty for a pit stop infringement could prevent Brock from winning. And this performance was the birth of the Peter Perfect legend and the beginning of an incredible winning streak at Bathurst. Brock's brilliance in the marginal conditions in the agile Tirana XU1 delivered his first victory in the great race against larger and more powerful cars. And this would be the last solo drive to victory by any driver. The only time he got a break, of course, was uh, during a pit stop. And I remember suffering from dehydration during the race. And I, I just, I was just, all I wanted was a drink. And it was hard to concentrate because I wanted a drink, to be honest with you. Uh, the best thing that happened for me was towards the end of the race. We felt there might have been a mistake with lap, lap counting at Bathurst, which has happened, of course, over the years. There's always this controversy. So they told me to go fast. And it was great because I really got into it the last sort of, uh, I guess, 20 odd laps. But uh, gee, it was, it, was a, it was a big ask. It really was six and a half hours or whatever it was behind the wheel of the car. Uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone to try it. Here they come. That's car one, the Holden Tirana of Peter Brock. Last year's Bathurst winner, he set second fastest time at official trials yesterday. It's an Although Holden's six-cylinder strategy had finally paid off in 72, 
it became increasingly obvious, especially to arch rivals Ford, that Mount Panorama was V8 heaven and that ultimately there was no substitute for cubic inches. The little Tirana could do well and uh, let's face it, it did do damn well. It was just that on occasions there was a, a GT in front of them. By the time uh, 1973 arrived, the planning department realized that as long as there was going to be a V8 under the bonnet of a Falcon, they better get something with eight cylinders under the bonnet of a, of a GM vehicle. I'm positive of that. But the Tirana SLR 5000 V8 was still eight months away from release, and Holden again relied on the XU1, now with Weber Carbys, upgraded engine performance and better brakes, all permitted with the ending of the showroom stock regulations. Speed, agility and fuel consumption were the Tirana strong points, and 18 of the Holden strike weapons lined up against five of the new XA two-door Falcon GT Superbirds. John Goss led the Falcon charge, but with the demise of the Fred Gibson Falcon, the Howard Marsden managed Ford team only had one remaining hope, the Moffat Gagan GTHO. Brock and Moffat were at it again in a furious contest across Mount Panorama. Tirana 6 versus Falcon V8. With Brock diving to the front on Mountain Straight, Moffat went spinning for the second consecutive year. Then, in one of the most dramatic mistakes in Bathurst history, a miscalculation of fuel stops saw the HDT Tirana stranded just 100 metres short of the pits. And a desperately anxious Peter Brock and team manager Harry Firth. 52-year-old co-driver Doug Shivers endured a gut-wrenching push to the refuelling point. Three minutes were lost. And so was any chance of victory, with Moffat and Gagan leading home four Tiranas. A year later, and Holden had V8 power back at the mountain in the form of the Tirana SLR 5000. The rivalry with Ford now entrenched in the folklore of the great race. Because of the intense rivalry, because of the fact that everywhere in Australia people talked about this race, and they sold cars on Monday. That was the most important issue is that General Motors could legitimately say, yes, we've, we've won this race on the weekend and we've sold another 4,000 six-cylinder Tiranas or, L or V8 Tiranas or whatever the, the, the road-going derivative might have been. Expectations were high when Bond led and Moffat's Falcon was out of contention following a long pit stop. At one stage, Brock and Brian Sampson led the race by a massive six laps until oil pump problems struck down the Holden bid. But even from the sidelines, Moffat continued to be a thorn in the side of Holden, advising Falcon privateer John Goss on tyre choice during a vital pit stop. In miserably cold and treacherously wet conditions, Goss and Formula 5000 ace Kevin Bartlett were left to carry the Ford flag, and they scored a popular victory. After two years of Ford's success, Holden needed victory on the mountain. Peter Brock, now as a private entrant, would deliver the first win for the Tirana V8. I don't think anyone would have won that race with a lesser budget than what we did during 75. Alan Moffat was saying he was building the car for down the straight. Now, he may be outbraked, but let's see. It's side by side. Bond is going a little later. He'll take a very difficult line on the outside. Moffat is not going to let him through. In fact, he closes up again because he knows he's got the line and he's going to shoulder Colin Bond out of it if he possibly can. And now it's all acceleration up to the line. This is only third lap and already it is neck and neck, side by side. Imagine the cheer from the crowd. It is Bond who's got the better gearing and has more acceleration and it is Brock who's behind who's closed on them both. But first in this time and being so close to Bond's nose is Moffat around the bend and now Alan Moffat leads the race and Peter Brock pulls out and decides that he might like to lead for a, a, a change and he goes up on the outside of, uh, of Colin Bond. A very, very plain Jane uh, L34 Tirana. Uh, I opted for running, I remember, I had Bridgestones on the car and I had very, very hard tyres and I thought, OK, I'm going to drive the car to a pattern all day. Three and a quarter lap and look at the distance between these cars. It's a real race and Brock is the one who wants to get to the lead. The single factory entry for Bond and open-wheeler ace Johnny Walker had qualified on pole and was hot favourite. But this car eventually finished third after being delayed with a broken axle. 
an engine failure had last year's winner John Goss in the pits, while the Alan Grice Tirana came off second best in a fight for racing room at Murray's Corner. The Moffat Gagan Falcon could not produce the speed and reliability for another win, a faulty gearbox slowing the big two-door forward. With inside of the flag, Tim Shankin's class-leading Alfa Romeo rolled. You can see where he's gone into the fence. The marshals approaching here. The flags are out to slow other cars. 20 seconds. The Alfa Romeo. John Fitzpatrick. No, not John Fitzpatrick. Sorry. Indeed not. No, it's the, the Tim Shankin car. The carnage could not slow the smooth as silk rock. Last time round, and the cloud acknowledged the man who's going to win this race. You see the nose on view as he approaches. Forest elbow. Again, the cheer goes up. He waves his acknowledgement to the crowd of the Three years the after his first win in a six-cylinder Tirana, Brock with co-driver Samson notched victory number two, leading home the Morris Gardner Tirana for what was a significant personal triumph. Peter, Brock will be feeling very happy now. Peter, Only 400 metres to go to take the checkered flag and win the 1975 Hardy Ferrado 1000. That's it. The checkered flag for Peter Brock in the 1975 Hardy Ferrado 1000 at Baffert. Bondi and Moffat were going pretty quick on tyres and cars that were potentially faster than mine, but I didn't get sucked into it. I, I stuck to my little game plan and really uh, it all paid off. What happened, I guess, is that we had to win to, to balance the budget. We, 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 were, we were skint and uh, it was a very sweet victory. With the backing of Ron Hodgson, the Sydney Holden dealer and racing patron, Bob Morris and endurance expert John Fitzpatrick pitched their privateer Tirana into battle against Holden and Ford rivals in 76. You know, we were like rebels in a sense, I guess. We tried to, to um, make our own path and do our own thing. And I think for Ron Hodgson, who was the principal backer during all that, that time, you know, he got a, a great thrill out of... Um, you know, sticking it into the factory, as it were. Some, like the much publicised combination of driving legends Sir Jack Brabham and Sterling Moss, never had a chance. 163 laps to go. the grid, Jack Brabham has been rammed in the tail. With the jammed the gearbox on the start line, line Sir oh, Jack one, was a sitting duck. As ever, Brock was racing hard in his own Tirana. Oh, he's in trouble there. You can see his hands left the wheel. It's Actually, uh, going down through the S's before he nearly got that car sideways, and I think he might have a deflating tyre. Colin Bond and John Harvey were sharing one of the dealer team's L34s and Bond was in superb touch in the greasy conditions. Quite a gap as he goes thundering up through the top. With the wipers on already, they have a wave from the car and still cold tires. And for the first time, it will be Alan Moffat using up all the road, a much tighter line by Colin Bond and he is going to snatch the lead. Brock made a bad mistake then. Bond, first across, Brock has dropped back. Battling now to retain fourth place, but he's lost it to Bob Morris and is Bond through for the second part. Morris was always in this race, tailgating Brock with a strong opening surge and then being perfectly positioned to claim the lead when Bond's car was delayed with a steamy pit stop. We have four laps to go and the leader, John Fitzpatrick, may not yet know the trouble unless he can spot that oil. Watch it there, that low angle. Now, he has a margin of how much? Oh, he about, about uh, a minute. A minute 20, I think it may be a little bit more, but he can't stop. It's a simple fact. He has to go. Well, he must go. Breaks. He must go. In the pits, I can imagine the anguish going through the minds of Bobby Morris and Ron Hodgson. And these are the men who are really suffering. It's just another race as far as John Fitzpatrick is concerned. Much as he'd like to win it, but for Bobby Morris, it's a lifelong ambition. It's so emotional. Fitzpatrick up through the And as the nation heart. watched a gripping finale being played out, Fitzpatrick made an agonizingly slow final climb up Mount Panorama. The Tirana L34, crippled by gearbox and axle troubles. As is Murray Carter. That's Bruce Richardson. That's Bruce Richardson, chief mechanic, who has worked himself into the ground here. That man has had no sleep for three months trying to get this thing all together, and you can see it going down the drain. I don't think it could be a better hand half him. He's not Morrison Fitzpatrick defeated a fast-finishing bond, and for the second consecutive year, 
a privateer team had triumphed over the factory-backed opposition. Well, so many people with so many hopes. There's Bobby Morris waiting there. Here he comes. The last one. The crowd. Look at the crowd. This, the cheers, the encouragement they're trying to give him to keep going. Situation is reversed as Bobby Morris's car, being driven by John Fitzpatrick, goes down through the bench for the last time. There's Bruce Richardson. He can't bear the, the pain of waiting. He's, and it's John Fitzpatrick through the bench. The car's still driving. And he weighs. He's got the checkered flag. And it's John Fitzpatrick who wins for the Rod Hudson team. And in the pits, can you imagine the elation that's going on in there? Bobby Morris. You know, Bathurst is a culmination not just of a year's work, but for me it was um, many years' work, having done the apprenticeship and having failed in a few previous years and also been second the year before with Frank Gardner and then to come back and look like we were so close again and, uh, you know, it was fairly emotional, I think. We put a lot of effort into it. Morris turned 26 the day after the Bathurst glory he had chased since his debut as a 19-year-old in the Toyota team. The following year, there was a much sharper edge to the forward bid for Bathurst glory, and neither Privateer nor Factory Holdens were to have any joy against the Moffat Ford dealer team. He just rubbed his shoulders around the outside of Hell Corner. American team manager Carol Smith was running a squad that had Le Mans star Jackie Ix as Moffat's co-driver, while Holden hero Colin Bond had switched camps to link with Alan Hamilton. Peter Rocky had Alan Grice behind him, and the two Falcons right on his hammer, and the field pouring up the mountain for the first time. And Grice is out for the lead. Rock's in front. Look how much ground Alan Grice has made up on him. John Harvey, another great start. He's up there in fifth place, just behind the two uh, Moffat Falcons. Grice is in sixth. A number to remember, and he's closing up all the time. This is not a 163 lap race. Grice is making a sprint of it from the start. Brock said he'd go as fast as they wanted to, and Grice has, must have heard the conversation. He's really provoking Peter Brock. Just wait as they come across the top of the mountain and a tremendous cheer going up from spectators. Just look at them. So thick up in the top part as Peter Brock is now still leading from Alan Grice. Then the two Ford Falcons, then followed back by Johnny Harvey. Once again down through the dip. But the two Fords very close together indeed. Then the two Marlborough 2 UE Holden dealer team cars as Basil Von Ruin is now attempting to be started here in, the, in front of us. And he is underway. Peter Brock once again still leading from Alan Grice. The two Fords, then the two Marlborough Holden dealer team cars. And what a race we have in this first lap of the event. It's Brock, Grice, Bond, Moffat. Then we have um, Harvey just leading O'Brien. That's the order as they come for the first time down Conrod Street. Grice closing under, uh, under pace. Look at this. He has the legs on Peter Brock. Now the braking will be the fascinating part. Will Brock let him go? Will he try now break him? They are flying, but Grice is going deeper. 77 was also the debut of the mighty Tirana A9X. Alan Grice briefly ran in the lead. Alan Grice the Graven Mile Tirana hatchback leads from the pole sitter. Peter Brock then further back to Colin Bond. Well, Alan Moffat now moving up into third. Bond drops back to fourth. The two Marlborough Holden dealer team cars followed through. Next by Kevin Butler, then the Bob Jane entry over the top of the mountain and here's Grice at speed with Alan Moffat tucked in behind him and the Ford fans on the top of the mountain are going wild. They want Moffat to pull out and pass down through this very demanding part of the circuit on the approach to the S's. And from our helicopter position you can see the, the distance between these two cars. This is a phenomenal pace for a 1,000 kilometre race. Grice and Moffat dicing. Bond is close right up. You can see how close he is now right on the tail and he'll make a move to get by them both. Grice is going to have his hands full halfway down Conrod straight because he tries to get out of the corner and then run as hard as he can. Brock taking a very wide line here. The two forwards are going for a bit of slip streaming and you'll notice both of them are about ready to attack Alan Grice here on the outside. Halfway down Conrod straight. Moffat pulls out, takes him on the outside and we'll wait and see whether Grice will try and race him into the braking area. He'll take Bond with him though, uh, Mike, and Bond is moving into second place and that'll drive the forward fans crazy with excitement. Here they come, but Grice is going to fight back on the inside of Colin Bond. Bond continues on. He's going very hard down the outside. Some team tactics here from Moffat and um, Colin Bond effectively letting Bond through for the lead, and that was a very good manoeuvre. Bond will now lead, and the fans down here in Pitt Street are going to go wild with enthusiasm. And up go the arms as Colin Bond leads Alan Moffat.
and Alan Rice further back then on the outside to um, Peter Brock, then John Harvey, and then of course the Gagan uh, Jane Carr. Yeah, Mazda just... driver Katayama pole vaulted off the end of Conrad Strait, destroying his RX-3. But this race was to be overshadowed by the now infamous Falcon formation finish. The Moffat Jackie X Falcon was ailing, but the Ford driven by Alan Hamilton and Bond was able to run flat out, poised for victory until ordered to stage this unforgettable 1-2 race finish. Up the top of the mountain with Colin Bond just sitting in, uh, not making any attempt to uh, manoeuvre. He's playing it strictly to instructions and this is the final half lap of the 1977 Hardy Ferrodo 1000 Classic from Mount Panorama with Alan Moffat virtually in a limping Falcon with a problem that uh, the team won't tell us about and uh, Colin Bond driving to orders just sitting in behind the boss and that's the way he's going to run out this race. Well, Alan Moffat might be nursing home a crippled car, but it's going to be the leader of a crushing victory to Ford in what has been the most competitive, the fastest, and the most international race we've seen here at the Mount Panorama Circuit. This Colin Bond pulls alongside. I don't think it's a threat to victory. I think it's just to line up the cars. Down the straight they go. Car one, car two. An absolute demonstration of the crushing victory to Ford here and the Alan Moffat dealer team. Moffat in car one, Colin Bond in car For the last time, they come down in that magnificent view from the seven helicopter, a scene we've never seen before. Side by side, Colin Bond marginally in front, but he'll ease up for the corner and let his team leader through, I would think, but he's in front at the moment. <laughs> he's going to have trouble breaking here to let Moffat through again, now he does. And this Moffat moment from the outside remains the pinnacle of Moffat's Bathurst career. For victory in the 1977... Well, I think Perotto, turning thousand. left onto the pit straight with Colin Bond alongside me in 77 was pretty hard to beat. A day of Falcon glory for Moffat, but on reflection, a low point for Bondi. The, the worst moments, and we've had a few, I suppose, when you look at not many accidents. We did have one crash, I think, in about 72 in the wet at the start of the race. But looking back in hindsight, it was probably letting Alan Moffat win in 77. At the time, it was the right thing to do because that was team orders and, and we did it. But, you know, if I had known the consequences now, I certainly wouldn't have done it that way. Well, 1977 really did have an impact. I mean, it was a one-two for Ford, and although there's been a lot of one-twos in races, this one stuck in people's minds. General Motors, of course, weren't too thrilled. They recognised that if you're going to win Bathurst, you had to have a car without any Achilles heel. That car was an upgraded version of the Tirana A9X with roller rockers, four-wheel discs and spoilers. The A9X hitting the track coincided with the return of Peter Brock to the factory team, the appointment of John Shepard to replace Harry Firth as team manager, and, in the rival camp, the plummeting interest in racing by the Ford factory, even though the 1-2 finish had fired up the general. We had Carol Smith out from America to help us. Uh, not an inconsiderable victory. They probably thought we had X D million dollar budget, and uh, I'm sure uh, they regrouped in 78. We never saw daylight again after that. He's going for broke. The inside will do. Wait for this. This is good. Harvey wisely elected to just ease off the throttle. And he's taking him up the mountain. What the devil's going on there? He's had a some extraordinary sort of uh, bump there. He's been hit in the back, and it has deflected the or, or changed the shape of the boot. They can't open the, the, the bonnet to get the fuel in. We know here's the man leading the index and they can't refuel the car. Oh, the car's on fire. Oh, look at Alan Moffat. That's fire. Alan trying to put the fire at himself with the, the uh, towel that he was using earlier. We have one of the, one of the Ford dealer team uh, pit crew, is it? What caused the fire, Alan? Oh, well, I'd say Cam's regulations would be a good starting point. Maybe somebody will wake up when we burn one of these cars to the ground that we can get the dry brake system to prevent that. I don't know what started it, but it's the fact that uh, we're vulnerable to this sort of thing. PX has lost it. Jack X has either had a lose there he up here. Yes. He just overran that. Maybe he's having trouble with the brakes. He might just not have uh, settled in. And he cannot get reverse gear. Now, now he's, he's got, got it. it. Now, if he gets locked in reverse, which happened to the car when it was in the pits, no, he doesn't. He's right back on the track again, and Jackie X 
Getting a great cheer from the crowd, some of whom think it's probably Moffat. We are just looking at the sad sight taken from our helicopter of your car parked under a tree. It's up at the top of the mountain, uh, near Castrol Curve, is it? Yes, it is. This is the great race, and this is the leader in car five, the lead car of the Marlboro Holden dealer team, Peter Brock. And uh, doing it well in front at the present time. And has accumulated, we should mention, uh, Evan, in the uh, lap leader prize money um, and other bonuses, nine and a half thousand dollars to this oh, point. 8,250 in practice. He could retire now and still come away well and truly in front. All Peter Brock, and he has scooped the pool as far as the Ingersoll Rand money is concerned, taking all of their four thousand dollars. So he's doing exceptionally well. Alan Grice coming over the top of the mountain. Car has run superbly throughout the day. He had his problems here last year, but uh, he's heading for a second place finish in the Hardy Frodo 1000. He has a two lap lead over Murray Carter in third place and is trailing Peter Brock by one lap at the moment. Gary will get all. We've lost a wheel, you can see their car 65, I think it has gone in there, which is uh, Rod Morris in the escort, he and Terry Finnegan. The wheel is missed by the others. The fans, fickle in some cases and uh, loyal in others, um, stand and salute. The man who's going to go on and win the Hardy for the this race, Peter Perfect's 10th anniversary at Bathurst, was the beginning of a golden era for Holden, Brock, and his new teammate, Jim Richards. Yeah, well, 78 uh, and 79, we had the uh, A9X Tirana, which was the best package for that era, there's no doubt about it. It was quite a small car in overall size. It uh, had plenty of horsepower, 400 odd brake horsepower, pretty good brakes, uh, very strong. Uh, and to me, I loved the car. I just thought they were fabulous. In what Holden fans saw as appropriate revenge, the Moffat Ford team failed to finish in 78. And in 79, things just got better for Holden. Brock and Richards were unbackable favourites, and they raced as such. Well, Moffat has made a brilliant start. He's flying and Brock is going. And here they come to that critical first bend. We have a touch-off in the Hardy Ferrado Classic for 79 with Peter Brock, 05 for the Marlborough Holden dealer team, zooming up Mountain Straight. And so here's our camera view in the Peter Williamson car in the small leader class. This is what it feels like in the opening corner and the first run to Mountain Straight. Peter Brock, 05, former national touring car champion, leads from Bobby Morris, Alan Moff, Alan Grice, Peter Jansen, then the rest of the field, and Brock, who was going to conserve in this opening uh, lap of the race, has established, even at this stage, what you would term a handy lead. The master in front, weaving across the road, the adrenaline pumping, 60 drivers out there, all trying their hardest, trying to conserve their cars, trying to go fast. But look at Peter Brock, and the crowd are going wild at the top of the mountain. They've got a Tirana 1, they've got a Tirana 2, and a Ford in third. And it's Brock down the bottom of the straight. A fabulous first lap. He's going to go through in the standing start in about 2 minutes 30 seconds, and that's quick time. OK, Conrod straight. This is what it feels like coming down, going through the gears, the brakes, as we approach the left-hander. Derek Bell alongside him in the Alpha, but just being slightly out so we've got a great dice on for the two-litre cars. They're running neck and neck. You can see the Alpha just slipping inside in there. Oh, oh right Dick sideways, Johnson. Dick Johnson. Johnson. And, and a complete spin. Queenslander Dick Johnson was an emerging Falcon threat, although a spin, then tie failure, put him out of the race. Oh, oh Dick Johnson is. has inverted the Ford, the Brian Bird Ford, in a very, very uh, tough place, and that's going to cause... Dick's still in the car, too. The marshals are talking with him. He's gone into the fence there. Alan Grice making this big bowl move on Alan Moffat coming up here in this pack. And John Harvey was making uh, forward progress very speedily. If you remember, Harvey started position 11, was unhappy that Moffat got a shot from the second row. And, and Harvey has gone has through. Grice moving up on Charlie O'Brien. Halfway down the straightaway that, of course, is Breville Conrad straight for this year. And takes him on the outside too. Now down through the gears as he has to take this left-hander. That's displaced him one spot. Grice goes back to third. Charlie O'Brien to fourth. John Harvey has come from 11th to fifth. Oh, 
Oh, bad luck indeed. This is the uh, the Ron Wanless Leo Leonard Denmark Ford entry uh, from Queensland. Um, Leo Leonard was to have started and uh, carried out the first driving stint. And I think he might have carried out the last driving stint, oh, but look at that steam, mate. Side by side as they come up to the left-hander onto Avco Mountain Straight. Who's going to give way? It won't be Charlie. No way. And Charlie says, all right, Alan, there's a bit of grass. Here comes Peter Brock. Into the pits. Take it away, Chris Economaki. Okay, here he's heading in very slowly, very cautiously. He's a wide, has a big lead. There's no need to hurry. We've started our clock now. We start the clock when the wheels stop. And there's going to be a driver's change, apparently, as Brock steps out and Richard steps in. Uh, it's nice that a driver can give his co-driver a bigger lead. They're changing the right rear tires, and there's the fuel going in again. The car's been in exactly 30 seconds now. The driver change has been affected. The seat belts have changed. Brock is giving... Richards, a little tip on how the car is performing. It's a very cool, calm, and collected pit stop. Extremely professional. Richards is zipping up. We'll wait now for him to pull out, and there he goes. And the stopwatch reads 45 and 1 100 seconds. One of the better stops today. We're seeing a sight we saw in 1976 when Bob Morris won the race, but now it's only two and a quarter hours into the race. And look at the smoke that has just begun to billow from the back of the Ron Hodgson Channel 7 car. And into the pits. Surely. The Morris A9X had a smoky gearbox and was out of contention, while Moffat's privateer two door just didn't have the pace. Moffat Falcon is in trouble. Tremendous trouble. John Fitzpatrick staggering out of the car. And that tells it all. The thing I hate most is seeing it on that vulture carrier, if you want to know the truth. That, that's really the sad part. I wish they'd leave them on the track. Brake actually. problems meant disaster for the second HTT car, crewed by John Harvey and Ron Harrop. The smooth efficiency of the operation is momentarily disturbed. It's a worrying moment. The immediate concern is to find out what has happened. I think that's what's happened to Ron. I'm pretty sure that's what happened to Ron. Is he back in the pitch yet? Yeah, he's back in the pitch. I've just been speaking to him. He's okay. He's just shaking up a little bit. Uh, where did it happen? On the Castrol curve, the right hander going up the hill. Plus, to add to that, as he got a little bit wide, the road was a little bit wet on the outside. The car just moved the ball and went over. Um, but as I went over the hump up the back straight there and right to the corner, there was just nothing at all. And um, just went into the fence, uh, probably about 80 mile an hour or so. The surge to the chequered flag by Brock and Richards was unstoppable. Well, I think we led every lap. Uh, we, we see Brock set the last, the fastest lap on the last lap. Uh, you know, it was just too good to be true. And wait for the, the reaction of spectators, the thousands upon thousands of them up the top part of the circus. Peter Brock, 05 for the Marlborough Holden dealer team, comes across the mountain. The man who has conquered the mountain three times and staring a fourth in the face. Uh, the fact is that Alan Moffat had retired early and he was doing the commentary and during my break I was aware of the fact that Moffat was commentating so I really went for it and the last lap uh, I actually set the lap record uh, purely just to show to people that uh, hey this car's running strong this is a this is a fine motor car. This is and the Marlboro Holder dealer team comes across to take the checkered flag. For 1980, the Falcon XD was developed totally by privateer teams, and mostly they struggled. For Holden, Australia's best-selling car, the Commodore, made its Bathurst debut, but the third leg of the Triple Crown was no breeze for Brock and Richards. Bartlett's monster Camaro was pulling more than 170 miles per hour down Conrod, and he shared the front row with Johnson's big blue Falcon XD. The Brock and Harvey Commodores were next, but it was Johnson who burst from the pack with a strong Ford challenge. Around, and here's the view from Bobby Morris's car. Johnson is away, and he doesn't want to be in any other position throughout the entire race. And he's got a long lead, and Brock is after him. And Bartlett now up into third place after that run up the mountain. Well, that shows the legs of the Camaro. He made up a lot of ground and passed three cars going up there, just in front of Johnny Harvey. Then it's Alan Grice next, who made a good start and is perfectly positioned. But it's Dick Johnson from Queensland, who for the first time draws the cheers of the crowd and the Ford flags are out as they come flying up the top of the mountain on lap one of the Hardy Ferrari 1000 for 1980. Wait for the cheers from the crowd as they come across the top of the mountain on lap one 
of the great race for 1980, the Hardy Frodo 1000. You'll be able to see the spectators, absolutely placards waving, standing there cheering because a Ford's going to lead the first lap of this race. Bartlett is back into third place, very poor start. But he's managed to uh, displace uh, Harvey, I think it is. And Mike Raymond, an ominous sign for Alan Moffat fans, oil already appearing, whipping around the back. He had an oil leak in the practice session, which did no more than deposit oil on the exhaust pipe. Wing back for the completion of the first lap. And it's Queensland's Dick Johnson, who leads from Peter Brock. Next is Kevin Bartlett, followed by Alan Grice, John Harvey. Bobby Morris is the next one, 100 metres back to Charlie O'Brien. And the next is uh, Larry Perkins, then followed by Gary Rogers. When Brock nudged a Gemini at Reed Park on lap 17 and stopped for repairs, Johnson was a lap in front and looking good. Brock, from second place to nowhere in seconds. The misfortune which usually strikes at others has involved him in a collision, anxious to get back into the race. Each second loss now is a disaster of great magnitude. Johnson is close to lapping the Marlborough car. The situation is potentially disastrous. It's been a bad stop. Johnson, having just lapped Brock, powers on. The Marlborough driver, within seconds, will witness an incredible change of fortune. But uh, things aren't going well his way, and of course we have Kevin Bartlett with even earlier troubles with his... Oh, we've had another bang and there's at the Dick, race. That's the leader. Dick Johnson. Now, whether Dick has been hampered by the, uh, the rescue truck here, which is out on the track, but uh -huh. he has gone into the fence. Dick Johnson, the leader, he's broken the left-hand front suspension. You can see, by the way, the car is leading down. After leading Johnson, for 30 now, laps, the Alan Grice Commodore, the, uh, under the watchful eye of Frank Gardner, could not hold off Brock and Richards, and it was a Commodore cakewalk. Now a steep climb up to the top of the mountain. And Jimmy Richards... Uh, is a driver who has co-driven to victory here with uh, Peter Brock twice previously. Uh, a great driver, one of the most underrated drivers in Australian motorsport. A very quiet man. He's certainly not uh, outgoing, keeps to himself a lot, but they call upon him to do a job once a year for the Marlborough Holden dealer team, and that's be the winning co-driver. We're just heading into Castle Curb, coming up on that beautiful little Alpha Sword. Take him on the outside, he doesn't crush me, I got him. There are those two big monsters. Here I come. Look out, you big ugly things. Get out of the road, you big ugly thing. Come on, move! That's the problem with these small cars. They go so well, and you get these things that just hold you up. He's just holding me bog slow. I guess it was a race that we didn't really expect to win to a large degree and we didn't go up there with the feeling we had the best, the fastest car. It was really a matter of perseverance. I knew the guys could put together a pretty good motor car and uh, certainly with Richo there we knew that we had the ability to get this car up. As it turned out the car was remarkably uh, fast around that track. For 81, the Holden dealer team left nothing to chance in the bid for its fourth consecutive victory, now facing the emerging challenge of the Japanese cars for outright honours. Top 10 qualifying was swamped by rain, although that was of little consequence to Big Rev Kev in the thundering Chev Camaro. Sunshine dawned for the race start, and the V8s were dominant in a tough battle for the lead. But there was to be no joy for the factory Commodores. John Harvey hitched a ride home, and Brock was delayed by a long and frustrating pit stop to replace a broken axle. As Johnson handed over the True Blue Falcon to loyal co-driver John French, this popular Queensland combination had the edge on the Morris Fitzpatrick Ford. We have an enormous traffic jam. We've had a horrendous crash at the top of the mountain. Johnson's battle's fortunes would soon turn full circle when a multi-car pileup, triggered by contact between the Morris and Christine Gibson cars, stopped the race with 43 laps to go. 
Grice's car is there, car 44. He's just stopped. He's not in damage, but there are a number of cars. Bob Morris's car is there. Bob Morris going so hard trying to get up the lead in second place. The track is completely blocked. A replay of it for you. Well, Christine Cole is involved. She was very early there. You can see Christine on the left. Bob Morris came along. He spun there, the car going backwards. Christine was involved first with another car. There are cars on the other side. Alan Brown. The track is completely blocked. We have Alan Grice in car 44 talking there. How are you, mate? How's your leg, all right? Huh? How's your leg? I think I broke something in the hip. KB's OK. He said he's, um, he's bruised his hip on the uh, hip brace in his car. Can you? He's, uh, he's okay. It doesn't appear to me as though anybody else is uh, damaged. When I arrived on the on the scene, um, there wasn't a great deal of activity trying to get people out of motor cars. So I can only assume that they've all uh, they've all safely got out. Covered and the red flag is used. The race must be declared. We cannot have a restart. The race was awarded to Johnson and French, and 13 years on, this remains the most recent Falcon victory. In 82, the flying Kiwi Jim Richards switched to the BMW team. Larry Perkins moved into partner Brock and the 05 squad. And a formidable combination of driving and engineering skills came together, providing the platform for another Brock Holden purple patch of three consecutive wins. Moving up smartly in the 9 Camaro to keep in touch with them. Then we have Ron Wanless going through in car number 16. Grice stretching the legs of the recar Commodore, heading up to the cutting. Dick Johnson running in fifth place, heading this third group through. Close behind him, John Harvey. Then we have Alan Moffat up through the cutting, the steepest part of the track, a one in six grade, very steep there, severe, a hard grind on gearboxes, a full load of fuel, the adrenaline pumping in the drivers. Harvey right on the tail of Johnson there. Wait for the chairs across the top of the mountain as Sydney's Alan Grice leads Peter Rock, then Kevin Bartlett in the 9 V8 Camaro down across McPhillamy Park. And it's Grice E. Brock right behind him. Back then to Kevin Bartlett. Gary Rogers is next. Dick Johnson. They were then followed by John Harvey and Alan Moffat. Crowd rise to their feet as they tumble down the other side of the mountain. Brock right on Grice's tail. They've dropped Bartlett off by about 10 car lengths. Gary Rogers in the second re car Commodore, then Dick Johnson. Alan Moffat sandwiched in there. Third it's time to Conrad Strait. Grice is the leader. Very close to him though is Peter Brock. Brock is perfectly placed to sit stream and pull out and pass, which he may do. There's a thousand dollars up for grabs too. Gregory's auto service manuals have a thousand up for the driver. Grice leaves the whole slam. And Grice is going to add to the total already of $15,000. He'll pick up $1,000 as he leads lap number one of the James Hardy. But Brock this time on the inside comes up the challenge and we take race cam from the car as Brock goes through to take the lead away from Alan Grice and the recar Commodore. And you were there when he did it. Peter Brock carrying the race cam up towards the cutting. Brock's in front. Grice pulls out the pass. Comes up on the outside of him. Brock can see it. Grice is going through into the cutting. He's going hard and deep. A second gear corner of this. A dab of brakes, up with the brakes and hard. Who goes the wider? Brock in very close, out wide to the fence, a little bit wider line. Up they come towards McPhillamy now, up the mountain. And Brock is going on the inside. There's the crowd, and Grice, though, still in front. It's a two car war between these long time rivals. They are using up all the track and a little bit more. I'm inclined to think that every team, every group of guys, every individual, has a period of time when they're, they're on a roll. They're, they're going to be successful in whatever it is they're endeavouring to do. It's just things go right. Grice was pushing just a little too hard. He's gone sideways into the sand. He went, he went there in the BMW last year, got stuck in deep sand. He has spun. I don't know how that happened. He didn't seem to be going in over fast. Whether he has a tyre problem, will he go into the pits? Or is he going to... No. no. Went there in the BMW Moffat last year. and Greg year, Hansford punished the Mazda rotaries, but they were no match for V8s on the mountain, which continued to exert its own influence. A bunch of taking out the irrepressible Kevin Bartlett. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Kevin Bartlett. Oh, roll is over. Bartlett has gone, he's got Dick Johnson maybe into it, no, Dick got out of the way, but the back tyre is off, the back tyre is off, Kevin Bartlett's car, he went wide, I think the tyre came off the start, slid into the bank, hit, and a very slow and lazy roll across the track, a master is there to try and get Kevin up, he's okay, Kevin Bartlett, another wretched year for him, he's looking to see the tyre, saying, what course, and that's it, and that's what it is, he says, Damn. he's happy, there's Brock in 0-5, left-hander at Murray's corner, 
Brock already has a lap on Johnson, remember? This had put him two laps up. He pulls out, moves alongside, down to the end of pit straight, the left-hander into Hell's Corner, and Brock is now two laps up on Dick Johnson. Oh, I'm just watching the BMW. Look, is that Jim Richards? Yes. The BMW, but maybe 41. And There's a fire, fire underneath. There is fire there. It's, you can see it there. He was squeezed out to give room for guard. No, it's, oh, 41. It's Denny Helm or Stephen Brook. One of the. I think it, by the slimmer figure, it's probably Stephen Brook. I think. Yes, it is. Stephen Brook. Oh, what one, one, one. Oh, it's car 38. Um, appropriately, it's Bernie Stack. He's had a good one. Alan Christ now in second position on the racetrack. There he is. Of a man who appears to be the 1982 James Hardy 1000 victor. Here he comes. The man is going to make it six, and he's got time to put the hand out the window and say thank you very much. Over the top we go, said Skyline. One of the real remarkable men of Australian motorsport. And even with the hand out the window, he's still able to pull away just a little from Peter Jansen. And through the S's. Down off the mountain. For the last time in 82, the flags are out. The crowd's going wild. The flag marshals are applauding. Well, here right side. On the ground right straight. Up. Go for it. Peter Brown. Here he comes now. Okay. The final time down. Conrod straight, speaking back with his pits. Jansen pulling up as Brock stretches it out just a little. Jansen tries to close, though he's well back behind Brock and Brock might even let him go past. Doesn't want to get involved in it, no he didn't. No way, stand by for the pandemonium that's about to break loose as Peter Brock comes around Murray's corner to take a flag. Then, Peter Jansen tried to gate crash race. Brock's finish line he's celebrations. He's the 82, James Hardy, 1,000 goes to Peter Brock. Before the 83 race started, Johnson's rejuvenated Falcon bid was on the scrappy following this qualifying bungle at Forest's elbow. Oh, he's hit the fence and he's gone off the track into a tree! There's Dick Johnson. He's sent a picture now. There he is, taking the helmet off. He's okay. Peter Brock, the 05 Marlborough Commodore, leads lap one of the 83 Classic. John Harvey making up the second and trouble for the Nissan team. George Fury's car is slowing. A replacement Ford never figured, nor did the Nissan Bluebirds, one of which had qualified on the front row. Brock stretches it. Teammate Johnny Harvey looking good out there, running in second place as they come through BP cutting. And there's the gap between first and second. Peter Brock out front and leading the James Hardy for 83. Oh, internal hemorrhage. The Kraft, Smith, Ford Capri. Now it's a tyre. Through the cutting. Alan Grice, presently placed in second. John Harvey, 25 in third. Alan Moffat across the start-finish line to complete yet one more lap in the James Hardy 1000 for 1983. Started off 14th position on the grid and is now up to eighth with a flock of Commodores, seven of them, in fact, in front of them. Hello, 0-5, Peter Brock is in the pits. Well, one sensation after another in this race. The leader of the race coming in very slowly, too just crawling into the pit area. The mechanics hustling around to find out what's wrong. They're putting fuel in. Anyhow, that's automatic. Larry Perkins, the co-driver, adopts the role of team manager. Says, what's the trouble? They've got the bonnet up. It's something up front. This is the car that carries the hopes now of the Holden dealer team, John Harvey, who has yet to win a race. Peter Brock, there's a, a very large stop of oil lying around down here. Puddles of it everywhere. And quite obviously, at the end of the straight, there was this great cloud of blue smoke came from the car. And it's Brock's quite apparent was on the brink of catastrophe with a terminal engine problem. John Harvey took over the race lead, but Brock pulled rank over brother Phil, took over the number 25 Commodore, and went on to win. Yeah, I guess I was a bit annoyed about the whole thing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I handed the car over in second place, so it was looking good, and I'm, uh, you know, quite certain in my mind I could have went on and won the race in my own right. Peter chose to continue with Larry rather than myself, and uh, that annoyed me. But I think the operative word you used was team, and it is a team effort. And the team won at the end of the day, and I got my name in the record book, so yeah, that was pretty good. 
and he's away. Peter Brock's back in the race, and uh, we'll see how the, uh, the whole mob of dealer team cars go from here. Alan Moffat in the 43 Mazda, and Bobby Morris, the comeback boy, in number four, driving the John Sands Commodore with Rusty French in this race. And then he outbreak him. It'll be side by side down into the braking area. Bob Morris on the outside, Alan Moffat on the inside with the right line, but Morris is going to persist. There's no braver driving at Bathurst today. But no, oh. Moffat is going to shoulder him out of the way and it'll be Moffat who will take the corner. He'll cut back on the inside, Morris, if he can pull it. And Alan Moffat, number 43, the Stuyvesant Mazda, having all sorts of trouble trying to shake Morris, who says, oh, I was shot on the inside. But pull it that time. They come into the left-hander. And once again, Morris will hound Moffat all the way to the top of the mountain. It's Lawrence Hazelton and uh, Jerry Starberg in... Um a Capri, one of the three litre class cars, car number 57, on the top of the mountain and off the wall, or on the wall, more like it, hanging on the wall. Huge dramas in the pits for Alan Moffat. They can't open the driver's side door. Katayama scrambles across. Moffat pulls open the passenger side door, remembering it's a left-hand drive car. Now Moffat clambering in, trying desperate to get into the car because Perkins leads him by a minute 26 on the track. How the devil the door became jammed unless Katayama's had a collision somewhere around the track with another car or with a wall. What an amazing incident. Moffat wrenching at the door, desperate, couldn't get... Oh, he's almost collected Perkins in car 25. Jinga me, that was close. An important pit stop here. Peter Brock getting back in. That's a quick stop. They're clear on this side, clear on the other. Water on the windscreen. Haven't got too much time to do it. Peter says, get out of the way, I'll go. And Brock is underway. He'll probably drive to the end of the race. Oh, no. Oh, the car's after, gone. After passing the car, and it's spun at the top of the mountain, coming down, just clips the wall. That is not a good place to be if anyone uh, was travelling very, very close to him at the time. So Peter Jensen has taken over from David Parsons. Has lasted only half a lap. Peter Brock, just look at the signs, the signals. And he acknowledges too. Enough time, enough uh, concentration still to wave back to the crowd. People who've supported him here at Mount Panorama for a long, long time. And even the people who support somebody else simply cannot help feeling a great deal of admiration for Peter Brock. Anybody that could win this race six times. Seven, seven times. This is number, this is number seven. That's again. right. Uh, deserves the greatest admiration. Certainly right. Quick wave to the cameraman. Quick wave also to the spectators. Great presence of mind. Through Forest Elbow. Only one straight to finish. That's Conrad straight. Arm out. Acknowledges the cheers from the crowd as he heads down Conrad for the last time. Peter Brock has certainly driven another great race in the James Hardy 1000 for 1983. Working into the final corner of the James Hardy 1000 for 1983. Down through the gears. He's done it. He's put seven on the board. Peter Rock wins the 1983 James Hardy 1000 at Mount Panorama, Bathurst. Down goes the flag and the 1984 James Hardy 1000 is underway. And it is George Fury, Peter Brock and Alan Grice running up with Adam Prang. Steve Masterton's gone in. Tom Walkinshaw is still there on the starting line. The rest of the field passing him by. He's been collected by a Camaro. Peter Williamson has also gone into the side of his car. And we have the track blocked across the main straightaway. So we've had... Uh, a very, very big accident here at the start of the race. It's going to be a restart. Two attempts were needed to get the 84 race underway. Scotsman Tom Walkinshaw, soon to play a key role in Holden Motorsport, was stranded on the start line with a broken clutch in the John Goss Jag. Someday the organisers are going to realise that this race needs a warm-up lap just like we did, not a parade lap. They're racing and getting away smartly as Peter Brock on the outside. Fury missed the start completely and Johnson ranges up on the inside to take over uh, second place as they run to the first corner. Tagging him is uh, Alan Grice and then Fury getting into stride. The BMW is out wide and then John Harvey making a good start as well as they stream up Mountain Straight. And there's the view of the entire field as it heads off for the first time up to the mountain and towards GTX Bend. Over the top and dropping down to the limits. Peter Brock in front, Johnson in second, Grice is third. And look at the challenge on back behind them, the black BMW and Alan Moffat already putting pressure there. Brock in front, the 05 Commodore Johnson goes through in second place. Then Alan Grice 
George Fury, boy, is he going to be disappointed about this restart because he got away really well first time round off pole position, but uh, on the restart, blew it badly and is in fourth spot. Alan Moffat hard on his heels in the RX-7. Over the top they come, sweeping through Castrol Curve. From the restart, the, top of the, the Fury Here's Bluebird the had no chance, and once more, it was Bronk and Johnson pounding away in their own private battle. On down to McPhillamy, take the left-hand curve. Lionister. Nobody gets wide here and survives. Jansen, Cullen, McLeod. Through they stream. The big forward of Brian Callahan in there as well. Through Forest Elbow and for the first time down Conrod Strait. And here they come. They'll be looking for speeds of 260 kilometres an hour or more. Peter Brock, Dick Johnson go by. There's Alan Grice now. Scott, sorry, Fury and Moffat. Into the braking section, down through the gears, and Brock is first on the first lap. Gathering him in a little, pulls out to the right. Slipstreaming him, obviously, before. Has he got enough to go past under brakes? No, he's got to back off. They negotiate Murray's corner. This is a real contest, isn't it? Great stuff. Rice still sitting here on George the tail. George Fury made his own impression on the Harvey Holden. Harvey on the run up, um, oh, up Fury! Oh, Fury is brilliant. Them. Harvey's off. Harvey has gone off on the right-hander, bounced off the wall. Fury arrived. Excuse me, boys, and he went through the pair of them. And As did the Falcon, driven by John English at the Dipper. Oh, my goodness me. Out of uh, Alan Grice's car coming down. Whoops. There is smoke and dust. And there's Steve Masterton, by the look of it, going off the course and crash and almost getting Grice on the way back. The car has gone across into the wall, into the earth embankment. Watching in front, Grice second, Fury third, Johnson fourth, Harvey fifth. And Cullen and Jones in their Commodore now up into sixth spot. Whoa, one of the Rovers is in the wall, car 60, Steve Soper and Ron Dixon's entry. Oh, the Group A uh, lead, they were running second in fact in the Group A category. They just consider how good these guys are, they're on a public road, they're racing, whoa, there's not much room there, but Grice takes the advantage, and Grice goes through to take the lead in the James Hardy 1000. You saw it with race cam as we drop into the Wilco cutting. George Fury sat on pole for this race and has dropped off the pace just a little bit in the last uh, five or six laps. Our second place man, is that Dick Johnson it is. pulling up? What's the problem? Oh, uh, some goddamn thing in the tank, I don't know. What, you, you got a fuel blockage? Oh, it's not a blockage, mate. It just won't pick it up. I'll be up through the cutting. I just wait for the reception that he'll receive on top of the mountain from all the fans that have assembled up there. They're waving us out. Look at the fans out on the hill waving the banners, the Australian flag. Go, Commodore, go. Parsons just goes past the pit straight now, so Brock's going to do this one by himself. Acknowledging the cheers and moving off to the left-hand side of the road to allow those other cars still to continue uninterrupted. And I say that's exactly what Peter Brock's waiting for. For David Parsons to try and form up so they can go one, two across the mountain. And the crowd really giving Peter Brock a send-off. The last trip of the uh, V8 Big Bangers, as they're called, the Group C touring cars. And Brock has done it again. Eight wins at Mount Panorama. I think the mayor of the city, I'd even call this Mount Brock. Here he comes. Don't say this wasn't orchestrated. A one-two for the dealer team. In 1982, 83, and 84, the most memorable was uh, the last one when uh, the team uh, came first and second. Uh, it was just a great deal of satisfaction, uh, personal satisfaction, that I could put my engineering talents to uh, very good use, not only as the co-driver to Peter, but in the engineering expertise to get both cars home very soundly. Lights ready. 85 was the year of the big cat and the start of the international Group A regulations. This exposed local teams to the European way of doing things.
is Johnson, and Johnson will split them, and save is Grice. Taking on the Jag, it was Walkinshaw made a blinder, but out of this to start completely. They head to the first turn, where Walkinshaw from Nick Johnson, they all go through and now make their way up Mountain Straight. A safe start to the 1985 great race with Tom Walkinshaw out in front in Jaguar number eight. Right on his tailpipe, though, is Dick Johnson in 17. Dropping in for the draft as they come up the hill is Jeff Allen. He's already split. Dick Johnson and makes his way up now into second place behind the loss. Great start, too, by Robbie Francovic, who's slotted into third place in front of Alan Grice. And there you can see race cam through the front window of Dick Johnson's Mustang. On their way up towards the top of Mount Panorama through Wilco Cutting. Really putting the boot in up here. The Jaguars, the pair of them, you can see powering away up front. This is where they've got the legs. Over the top of the hill now, heading down towards Toledo Corner. And Tom Walkingshaw and the Jaguar leads a one, two. Jeff Allen in second. Francovic is third. There's Johnny Goss. He's made it up there into about fifth spot. And he's been tailgated there by Peter Brock. Across the mountain. Jags, one, two. Grice getting right on the tail now of Robbie Francovic. And Jim Richards also coming out of the draft. And a good start by Colin Bond. Big effort there by Peter Brock up in the sixth position, coming off tenth spot on the grid and really hounding Johnny Goss in the third of the Jaguar entries, trying to get past. Well, there's the shot out of the back of the leading car. That's the Tom Walkingshaw Jaguar looking at Jeff Allen, the teammate. Driving car number nine, and behind him, Alan Rice closes up appreciably over this part of the mountain. There's Rice. He's making a lunge at that nine Jaguar. He's doing a very good job. Coming down to the exit of Valvoline Corner, and now onto the straight. This is where the uh, Jaguars really power down. It had been two decades since a British-built car conquered the mountain, although the inclusion of John Goss with Germany's Armin Hanna provided a local presence in the winning car. Reluctant to sever his Ford links, Johnson entered a V8 Mustang with Larry Perkins as co-driver. They ran hard early with the Brock Commodore and Jim Richards, now in a six-cylinder BM. Walkinshaw's oil supplier was kept busy satisfying the thirst of the V12 Jag. With the twin BMs of Richards and Fury busy building sandcastles, the European combo of Roberto Revelia and Johnny Giacotto carried the BMW hopes. Larry's taking it quite uh, gently up the shelf here, Gary. It doesn't sound to be revving to the sound of a little Ford V8 that I'm accustomed to flat tire apparently uh, so we've just had a report from the top of the mountain or a deflating uh, tire front left i think uh, possible can see yes yes Ooh, oh the boy, wheel's not on it. oh man uh, and and couldn't have happened in a worse section of the track if he were to stop here he's getting the raspberry from uh, the commodore and the jag fans on the top of the mountain through that dipper there and it was amazing it stayed on through that there goes kevin bartlett and the stallion slipping by him the thing is, though, that if he can just coax it through here and get it onto the straight, do you think he can make it back out? I do, because he's in the worst positions at the moment where the car is getting loaded one way or another. It almost looks as if the guard is holding it on, uh, or there is some some form of a safety mechanism that I'm not familiar oh, with. Oh, that doesn't look but too safe. Obviously, Larry, you know what's wrong, and you're taking it very steady. I'm certainly taking it steady. I've got either a dead flat front tire or it's full. Or it's very loose, Larry. We've been able to see from the outside, and a couple of times it's looked as though it was about to part company, but it's just hanging in there. You'll need to be very careful through the uh, pit entry lane. It certainly feels that way. I think the wheel is not on the drive dogs, and when I put the brake on, the brake stops, but the wheel keeps turning. The the curbs. With his front Watch windscreen already go gone, go. Brock was ordered by officials to remove the back one. Mechanic Marty Watt boom, had the boom. answer. Goodbye, Pete. Super kick. Marty Watt dived into the back seat, kicked it out with his feet, and I, of course, dropped the clutch. And Marty just nearly came for the hottest lap of Bathurst he'd ever seen. And he was rolling the barrel roll out the door backwards and everything else off we took. Just look at Brocky putting in the big ones now. What followed was a magnificent chase of the VM and Jag by Brock, which failed in the dying stages of the race. A bit of time there, waving his hand at a slower driver, concentrating on passing the ones in front got by but he's definitely got Revalia in sight and it'll only be a couple of laps whether he can take back the lead Jaguar 
is questionable. It's a bare two and a half seconds now between Revalia and Brock, and only 37 seconds between Goss and Revalia, so it's closing right up at the head of the field. Brock looking for a way through. There's the uh, orange BMW. Whips into Mountain Straight. Brock's got by, and is now out in hot pursuit. He's not fooling around. No. He took some chances there under brakes, and I think uh, Jim gave him a little bit of uh, courtesy there. The mountain crowd are cheering Peter Brock along, and he's cheering himself along there. The grip of the uh, rally tires there, and under brakes, whipping him around. He's not fooling around. Very fit. Peter's mentally ready for this race. I think he practices for it every day. And when it gets here, it's no chore for him. Uh, here's the Brock crew. They're all sitting there staring. They want their boy. And he is closing on Roberto Revalia. And here he comes from behind. No front windscreen, no rear windscreen. Air-conditioned mountain racing for Peter Brock as he storms down the outside. And the Brock crew are quite elated. Peter Brock now moving up on the scoreboard and takes Roberto Revalia. He now moves to second. Brock looking for a way through. There's the uh, orange BMW. Whips into mountain straight. Brock's got At by. At the 11th hour, I think it's three laps from the end. Uh, the timing chain, and we were forced to use a single row timing chain in those days instead of the double row, which was the normal thing that uh, Holden VH used, but uh, it snapped like a carrot. From a personal point of view, that 85 race was sensational. I mean, we had a car which wasn't as good as what it could have been. Um, we gave it our very best, and gee, we almost did it. Coming down through the dipper at uh, Nissan, and all giving John Goss a marvellous reception as he pokes the number 10 car down to the exit of Valvoline Corner. And this is the final lap of the 85 James Hardy 1000. The pressure is now off his shoulders, although he might be losing the seat. Well, here he comes, Johnny Goss in car number 10, the JRA Jaguar. Just wanting to make sure that all goes well for the final quarter or as we say, another two Ks to the end of uh, Conrod Strait. And look what he's waiting for. Would you believe uh, this? The man who instituted is the 1-2. Is he a pro? Johnny Goss is going to engineer the 1-2 JRA Jaguar finish to Australia's great race. Chalk up one. John Goss, the winner of the James Hardy Classic for 1985. Second place will go to Roberto Revalia. And third place, after all those problems, will go to Tommy Walkingshaw. So a Jag 1-3. Yeah, but it's still a long way home, really. <laughs> Unthinkable as it may have once been, the V8 icons of the 70s, Peter Brock and Alan Moffat joined forces in a works Commodore in 86. This Mount Panorama partnership was Touring Car Racing's dream team, but it produced only nightmares for ex-Falcon hero Moffat. Friday uh, afternoon, Friday morning, and a uh, Commodore uh, got a right rear wheel into the uh, dirt, getting my mind off the job. She dug in, turned left instantly, and I hit the wall. Pretty frightful. I thought I was going over the wall, actually. But as it slid down and came to a halt, all I realized was that I damaged the car. It was a low point for Moffat and a major rebuild job for Holden Mechanics. Gary Scott let it all hang out in the turbocharged Nissan Skyline to claim pole position, although in the race, it was the homegrown Commodore V8s that led the turbocharged challenge across the mountain. Racing and Grice just spreading off the field. He's gone. And all the cars seem to get away nicely as they head down the front straight away towards the left-hander. There's Ricey chopping straight into the left-hander. And so beautifully he takes it through there as they head up Mountain Straight for the first time. The field goes through without an incident in the first quarter. We've got a safe start to the 1986 James Hardy Classic as they head up Mountain Straight towards Bridgestone Quarter. Just look at the field sweeping. Ricey! the way to the floor leads the turbo distance of Gary Scott. Larry Perkins running in third place. George Fury is fourth. And you can wait as they go through Bridgestone Corner and work their way up to the BP cutting for the reaction as Australia's Commodore leads the turbo challenge across the mountain for the first time. Bryce, Scott, Perkins, then George Fury in fourth place. 
up down to BP Cunning and the climb to the top of the mountain. A couple of hard hit Brock in 05 who had to come from 11th position, an unaccustomed position for him on the grid, and he's already making up ground into about 7th, 6th position on the racetrack. Through they go, Christ Scott, Larry Perkins, Fury, up to the top of the mountain. Fans on their toes as they go over for the first time under real race conditions for 86. By oh, gee, look at the lead that Grice has opened up. Grice absolutely flying. He's using his 17-inch Yokohama tyres. And there's the shot from Peter Brock's race cam. In behind George Fury as they go down over the top of Skyline. Now down to the S's. And the tail end of the skyline really starting to float around. Behind Brock, we had John Harvey in the number three mobile Commodore, then Dick Johnson. Behind him, John Bow and Graham Crosby. This is second place. Perkins is third. And there's the leader, Alan Grice, with around about a two and a half second gap as he leads on to Conrod Strait. It's the shot from race cam. Midway down Nissan Conrod Strait, coming around to end lap number one of 163, and it's Alan Grice in the lead in car number two, the Chickadee Commodore. Just but not even turbochargers and fancy factory deals, nor princely intervention, or good doctors were going to win this race, which quickly went from bad to worse for Brock and Marvin the Magnificent. I didn't enjoy hitting and causing the loss of the race in 1986. We should have won Bathurst, but uh, hit that bloody uh, speed humps in the pit lane, the Ivan Stibbard uh, humps, and uh, tore the oil cooler off. I thought I'd slowed down, but the old story when you've been doing 250K and you pull up and, and you think you're going nothing, but I must have hit it doing about 80. And uh, the boys, well, they fixed it, but we lost the race. It's a leak in the oil cooler. Alan didn't notice it. The temperatures are all okay. So they're just bypassing it right now, which means it's just running, uh, well, without an oil cooler. That's OK. The temperatures are quite low. Yeah. I think the guy's about getting me going here. OK, we'll leave you to it, okay, Pete. Mate. Thanks for talking to us. Righto. See you later on. Get down. Peter Brock, out of the pits, six minutes and ten seconds stationary while they removed and bypassed the oil cooler. That's Grice pulling out in front of Harvey. Harvey has spotted the back of the Chickadee Commodore and cross in for the ride too as they head up uh, Mountain Strait. to Bridgestone Corner. Now working their way up the straight. Oh, Harvey goes into the side of Grice. I think maybe Grice was claiming the corner, but... Uh... No, Grice has a problem. He had a problem before. He slowed quite... Uh, is it possible to slow rapidly? <laughs> anyway, he slowed, and that's really what happened. It really caught uh, Harvey out totally. Look at this. John Harvey leading the great race, and sitting right behind him is Alan Grice. This one looks like going down to the wire. Harvey still with a stop to come. Grice putting the pressure on. He's closed that gap to practically nothing at the moment. Lap 105. The two Commodore drivers, Harvey and Grice, up front leading from Gary Scott in the Nissan number 15. Then, of course, Jim Richards in number one, Dick Johnson in 17. Peter Brock coming back through the field in five. So how close do you need it? To Bridgestone Corner, the right-hander, swinging up to the top of the mountain. Here they come. Out of BP, heading up to the top of the hill. Harvey down the inside of the BMW. Grice just backs out of there for a moment. Richards gives, I think it's Richards, gives racing room on the inside. And what a race we've got going after 105 laps with all the dramas of today. And this is the gap between first and second. In the 86 James Hardy Classic and Grice on the outside, what a move! Takes him coming across the top of the mountain, so Alan Grice takes back the lead in the James Hardy 1000. Harvey still in second, and third is Gary Scott and the Nissan. This was a day for Grice, the prince of the privateers, and chicken farmer Graham the Bailey. Despite a leaking differential, they finished ahead of the John Harvey Neil Lowe factory Getting Commodore the and the Works Nissan driven by Gary Scott and Terry Shield. Straight. There he goes. He's going to get a wave off to everyone before this is over. He's watched so many drivers do this for so many years. Hands are ready at the top of the mountain. 
as Grice heads up to Bridgestone Corner for the final time. And of course, after the race is over, the cars are pulled straight in at the back of the pit, so you don't really get a chance on a cool down lap to acknowledge the waves of the crowd. Up to BP Cutting for the final time. The Sydney Privateer, Alan Grice, driving Graham Bailey's Chickadee, number two, Commodore V8. Coming up to Toledo Tools Corner, the right-hander. Wait for the reaction of the spectators along the top of the mountain. They love him. Here he comes. Alan Grice, the man who went to Europe this year to try and prove something. He certainly has done that, and he's proved an awful lot more here today. As the fans acknowledge, Ricey coming across the top, out of Castrol Curve, down to the S's, through Bridgestone Corner, to the Dipper for the final time. Now on his way down to the left-hander, and here he comes. Through Valvoline Corner, Nissan Conrod straight for the final time. You can almost coast home to victory from there. I know how happy he must be, Michael. I've never seen anybody wave and cruise round on his last lap. He's got 96 seconds in hand, which is probably enough, but I should think he's risking it just a little bit, isn't it? Well, I don't know. It's 16 years without a result here. He's finished a second and a third. But you can shut the engine off from there and make it all the way down to the checkered flag. Alan Grice leading, 96 seconds clear of Harvey. A long gap back there to Gary Scott. The last corner comes up as Grice and the Chickadee Roadways Commodore V8 hits the last turn, straightens it out. Checkered flag at the ready and the Aussie Privateer, the battler, cracks it for the Hardy 1000 at Mount Panorama and the crowd has erupted. He's done it. 1986 uh, was the sort of race that will give privateers hope forever against factory teams. The car and the preparation and the organisation of the preparation and the tyres and uh, the drivers were um, ready to do the number. And as I said, um, I've driven uh, as a privateer against the factory and I've driven for the factory. And to my mind, uh, that was the greatest crush that the factory had ever received. And to do it as a privateer uh, is something that uh, I'll always remember. By 87, the international Group A category was really making its presence felt. And there was an influx of overseas teams and drivers for Bathurst, which counted as a round of the World Touring Car Championship. German ace Klaus Ludwig led seven turbocharged Ford Sierras into the top ten and just two homegrown five-litre V8s. The Commodores, Valen Grice and Larry Perkins were not given a chance. Peter Brock was out of favour following his much-publicised bust-up with the Holden corporate heavyweights, triggered by the now infamous energy polarizer. But he was there with a two-car team and just as well. For when the engine in 05 quit, Brock and co-driver David Parsons transferred to the backup car driven by Peter McLeod. Earlier, Perkins was out when shunted from behind. Axle problems ended the run of the Grice and Win Percy combination. Look at this, this is Mount Panorama Later, a savage rainstorm turned the track into a skating rink, provoking unhappy exits for BMW entries, including Johnny Chicotto and the Gary Brabham Fangio M3. In appalling conditions, a young Glenn Seaton mesmerized everyone with his incredible car control in a Nissan Turbo Skyline. But as the Sierra Steamroller, headed by Ludwig and Soper, raced for line honours, there was another storm brewing over fuel and illegal body panels used by the flying Fords. The word came through to our pits, forget the Sierras. They're not going to win this race. They are going to be outlawed. So we finished up the race as far as I was concerned. Look, I thought, look, I'll finish third today. Fantastic, best effort we could put in. I was wrapped in the team's performance. 
Following months of protest hearings, the Sierras were formally disqualified, and this became the ninth Bathurst win for Brock and Holden, with Brock saying he was happy to accept the verdict. Thanks for all your support out there too. However, not even this belated success could patch the rift. And for 88, Brock defected to BMW, linking again with Jim Richards. Tom Walkinshaw decided he needed just one more race team, and he concluded a deal with Holden to run the factory racing team and the special vehicles road car business. So the man who crushed the locals with a V12 Jag now returned in a Commodore with considerable British engineering input. The Walkinshaw Holden marriage didn't start in a blaze of glory. The boss's car struck pit problems and was sidelined with rear suspension failure. The Larry Perkins Denny Holm HSV Commodore ran as high as second before retiring, while this blown tyre had a few moments earlier given Johnson a wild Sierra ride. He's had a lose of 260 kilometres an hour. His pit was ready. The Sierra survivor was the Tony Longhurst Thomas Mazera entry, taking over following Johnson's demise and claiming top prize. For more than 20 years, roaring V8s had been a part of the Bathurst legend. By 89, many of the drivers were still the same. Bon, Johnson and Brock. But the cars were changing. Whistling turbochargers and computer chips had taken hold of the mountain. Even Brock was in a Pommy turbo car, and it had a Ford badge on it. Richards and a young bloke called Mark Scaife were also turbo boosted in a Nissan Skyline. The HRT Commodores were for Perkins and Mazera, with Win Percy joined by Neil Crompton. They ran hard, but not hard enough. By sheer weight of numbers, a Sierra win in 89 seemed inevitable, and it was claimed by John Bow and Dick Johnson, who finally went the distance at Bathurst. This was not an encouraging close to a decade that had seen six Commodore V8 victories. Rest of the race without a change, boy, that's going to be an advantage. The new decade opened with the formation of the official Holden Racing Team under Tom Walkinshaw's direction. This was the long-awaited replacement for the famous Holden dealer team and best factory assault since 84. Win Percy and Alan Grice were backed by Neil Crompton and Brad Jones in a two-car team that faced the Turbo Sierras at their peak and the emerging force of the Nissan GTR. The HRT Commodores were by no means favourites against the highly tuned Sierras or the private Commodore teams including the Perkins Mazera lineup. Stalling back from 16th after early clutch problems, Grice and Percy ran down the Nissan and Ford turbos. You can see the ground now, the Grice is pulled on the Nissan. Right up onto the tail of it again. Fantastic stuff. This and they're just awesome down this straight. Yeah, 620 horsepower. Well, what's pulled, happened here? He's pulled wide there as they went into Forest Elbow. Now, if there's no problem with the car, he'll just shoot straight past again down the straight. Well, all Gricey wants to do is leave this. Well, he's doing it. So the Holden Commodore comes from behind to pass the Nissan GTR for the lead. Neil Cropton. Doing very well here with young Bradley Jones. Good to see two young guys given the opportunity by uh, Holden. Holden competitive this year at uh, Mount Panorama. And I think you'll find that Holden will be even more competitive in 1991 with their new package. New package certainly looks like it might do the trick, but the old one's doing fairly well at the moment there. Crompton gets a little bit sideways out of the cutting as he makes his way past one of the back markers. And uh, running well inside the top ten. Just around about a lap down on the moment, uh, on the Nissan at the moment. The Nissan about 17 seconds ahead of the second place car of Dick Johnson. And I was about to say the 17 Johnson. car has dropped back and that is Johnson's is. car. Yeah, that looks like the turbo's finally cried enough. That white smoke is always a bad indication, dearie me. That so looks like the turbo has had it for the day. John Bauer brings in the 17 car. see much around the car. There's smoke all over the place. You can barely see the guy get there's bow. He's got smoke in his eyes. What a tragedy for Dick Johnson. Here's our race leader, Win Percy, the number 16 Holden Commodore, sponsored by Telecom Mobiles. I think we expect that car in the pits probably next time around. 
pit stop also for the 18 car is not that far away. It's running six, uh, second rather to uh, the holder at the moment. Paul Radisic will step out, Rob Gravett will step in. Again, the Dulux Auto Colour race cam from the flight deck of the V8 Commodore. Win at the wheel. That's a pretty healthy sight for Australian race fans. It's Australia's own. All the needles on the gauge is pointing in the right direction. The engine sounding strong. Hello. Oh. They've got the Nissan's got a problem. Richard's slowing on Conrad. There's smoke billowing from the back of the car. And just when we were saying what a fantastic run it was having, look at this. Richards, he looks like he's just lost all drive in the car. He's limping down the straight. He's got a fair way to go still. Yes, he has actually. Might even be lucky to make um, even the pit road. Been okay in the old days. You could just coast it straight down. This end was running for Jim Richards at the wheel. Win Percy, race leader in car number 16. The Allen Rabbit car, 18, running in second. This was third. That means Larry Perkins will probably now move up one spot. And listen to the noise inside the car. That sounds dairy man. There's something in the transmission's gone with that car. That sounds very, very serious. It's all happening here at Mount Panorama. All sorts of clunking and grinding and grunching going on there. And he's Watch slowing this. down. He's going, to, for... he's going to hold up a race leader. Win Percy coming into the pits. Let's hope he doesn't stop. No, he's going to be right. He's going to get into his pit. Look, Percy. Oh, Percy. sideways. Bang, bang. Him up. Okay. Look. So it's all happening here. Back in the 11 car. The computer lap score shows Larry has now taken the lead away from the 18 car because of that pit stop. And of course, Alan Grice back in third spot. So it all changed there in a matter of uh, three or four minutes. 18, of course, rejoining the race in second place. So Thomas Mazira, car number 11, running at the head of the pack. And Peter Brock, just in and out of the pits, hasn't dropped a spot. Still runs fourth on the road at the moment. We've had coming together at the top of the mountain here, car number 37. Here's our camera sitting on the wall. Pow, it just never made the turn. The pit stop going at 40 seconds, the engine started, 42, this is a great pit stop for a full change, and they're getting the wheel nuts up now, 47, 48, Perkins really will be happy with this, 50 and 52 seconds. Oh, gee, great stop, really great pit stop. The crowd comes alive along here on um, pit straight, but I think you'll find that it maybe has missed the queue, has it was he? Perkins who conceded a handy lead while locked in pit lane, waiting for the pace he car to pass. That is bad luck. Last lap, it's a nice little side. There's some happy boys and sick heads up here. Ricey came home just 15 seconds ahead of the Radisic Alam Sierra and the mountain men were beside themselves. Fans on top of the mountain, here he comes. And they love the Oh, look at them, you've made their day. Slippery out of there too. Yes. Uh, uh, well, whoever's loading the oil, if they're doing it on the last lap, I hope they make it home. It's been great to ride with you and win Percy with our seven Dulux Auto Color race cam, Alan. Well, it's been an absolute privilege to drive this motor car. I can assure you of that. It's, uh, it has the most brilliant brakes I've ever felt in touring car. Got it. And. Uh, Bridge coming down to the final corner. Checkered flag time. Crowd absolutely berserk. Last turn. Checkered flag. How does it feel? To his champ, Alan Grice. Wynn and I did extremely consistent, hard, fast laps all day. And uh, that was the thing that won. Um, I'm sure that uh, if the Sierras were able to run off that year, and create a bit of a cushion and ease back on the boost and ease back on revs, they would have uh, perhaps come one, two, three, four, five, and who knows where. Right, I'll push it away quickly. So the general was back with three Commodores finishing in the top five. Perkins and Mazzera third, and the Crompton Jones car fifth. 
Until delayed by a busted CB joint, the six-cylinder four-wheel drive GTR had charged to the front and was quickly dubbed the Godzilla of touring cars. Listen to the crowd, they're loving this. By 91, Brock was back in a privateer Holden, having forsaken Sierras for a Commodore V8. This qualifying run didn't produce pole position, but it sure got the fans going. I love the back, I kept the pedal to the metal, as you know, Slag. <laughs> Holden had the VN Commodore on the track, with Percy and Grice looking for a repeat win. It was another fine effort by these race-hardened professionals who finished second as Nissan completed its 10-year quest for victory. Richards and Scaife did the deed in the GTR, and not even the Sierras could keep pace. The final year of the International Group A regulations in 92 heralded the swan song of the turbo cars, and they would go out in a blaze of glory and controversy. There were familiar Holden faces and some new ones like bike champ Wayne Gardner swapping his Honda for a privateer Commodore ride. Holden's day started badly with Brock stranded on the grid by driveline failure, while the works Nissans began their relentless push for a second consecutive win. Neil Crompton had moved from HRT to the second GTR, and when low cloud descended and sheeting rain blew across the track, a four-wheel drive Nissan seemed a good choice. On the right? Oh. But others, like the Peter Hopwood Sierra, just didn't make it through the fog. Brock had no chance, but was still in the thick of it, copying this headbutt from Gricey in appalling conditions. With the circuit awash, cars were crashing uncontrollably. Even acknowledged Rainmaster Richards was crippled when his GTR aquaplaned into a wall. Oh no! Oh no! I don't want to be unkind, but Winfield... The race came to a dramatic and sudden conclusion with the Crompton Olufsen GTR third behind the Johnson Bow Sierra. Jim Richards and Mark Scaife had set the pace and were proclaimed the winners having dominated the shortened race. It was bitterly cold and wet at the mountain, but the Nissan drivers received a hot reception. The prospect of another full-scale Holden Ford shootout in 93, following the rebirth of the V8 touring car regulations, had the fans out in force. Women running strong from the east to the west And banging fenders to give you all the best Been setting records in every state We're back in town Well, the car's in the back and the shutter's down We're all heading for the Bathurst Hill To see Rocky and the boys serving up a thrill We've been feeling the heat You can hear it cuss We've been kissing fences Been choking on dust we curse the rain, we curse the sand We're running hot, turn it on for the fans To the boys from the bush, we're back in town The green flag drops and the foot goes down We're all members of the horsepower set And the king of the mountain is the guy I gotta get To the boys from the bush, we're back in town Then the cars in the back and the shutters down We're all here, we're the Bathurst boys And you can't hear it, show above the noise Yeah, to the boys from the bush, we're back in town Then the big guns roaring, shaking the ground Get 
checkered flag and you're walking tall. Get the checkered flag and you're walking tall. And as we welcome you to our 10 hour coverage of the Two East 1000, we welcome you to one of the most open races in years. 10 seconds away from the start. Larry Perkins and Mark Scape. Who will it be into the first turn? Now the revs come up. Off, racing, Perkins by the country mile. Wins the start, Scape is novel by about three on the inside as they come roaring up to the first turn. VH Support Squad welcomed the return of faithful son Dick Johnson to a Falcon, while Glenn Seaton and Alan Jones were also factory assisted Ford frontliners. Lead of the race is Freddie, Freddie Gibson, Gibson India, who had both won and crashed in Falcon V8s at Mount Panorama, entered a Commodore V8 for Richards and Scaife. It would be this high profile team and the low key one car Commodore entry of acclaimed engineer Larry Perkins who would turn the race into a Holden family feud. Johnson has Dick Johnson's the early Falcon going. challenge on HRT Steve signing Wayne Gardner didn't pay off, signalling a bad day at the mountain for the Falcon man. It was a cracking pace at the front. Perkins and co-driver Hansman emphasising that the race had become a 1,000 kilometre sprint event. No longer is it possible to set up a lead and cruise to the chequered flag. HRT driver Wynn Percy made an unexpected exit and it was left to Gardner and Brad Jones to secure third place. The, car comes in, the Perkins Hansford pit stops were perfectly timed. They held a 12 second advantage in the closing laps and Perkins defied a late race charge by Richards. The 93 as they come across the strike and yes it's there and the crowd go up as Perkins takes it up to the left hander. Greg Hansford can't believe it. Nothing could be so cruel to rob him of uh, this one, or Larry for that matter. The gap is uh, still constant. Back to uh, Jimmy Richards in the number one Whitfield Commodore. Actually, back looking, in third. Looking Gun at that, he's reduced it a bit. It's 13 seconds now. He's not going to make 13 up in one lap, but I'll tell you what, he has come storming back at him, has uh, Jimmy Richards. I suggest Larry's probably easing off a little, is he? <laughs> he's the insurance policy yeah, is being filled in. Richards just put in a 219, Larry's done a 222. So, uh, as you know, motor racing a second is good enough to win a motor race. Larry's just got to get across the top. He can almost coast from there. BP cutting for the final time. Some slower cars for Larry to deal with as he hits the top of the mountain. To his red turn is the next one. Here he comes, a kick to the left. The crowd are already ready to welcome him. <laughs> Don't they know it? LP. Here he comes. LP on the gas. To his top gun. Season. 93. It's a record crowd, it's a pretty vocal crowd. This is what they came here for. Slower car up ahead, Larry gives him plenty of space. I think you'll find that's uh, John Cleland. John Cleland up in the 05 car ahead of him. Look at, right behind. Look at the marshals. Larry Perkins returns to the mountain. Last victory here in 1984. It's taken him nine years. He's a triple winner. He's got to add number four this afternoon. A long time between drinks. I'm Larry Burger, this will be a sweet one. Choice of tyres, we questioned his choice of tyres when he decided to go out on slicks when the rain was coming down quite heavily earlier. Uh, we wondered if it was a mistake, it certainly was the right choice. Yeah. And he's going to reap the harvest. Well, he's putting a quick little sprint in here, down towards Caltex Chase. And through the years, a couple of cars to deal with before uh, the chicken flag comes out. Come on, yes, sir. Yes, he's done very well. It goes out of here, Bridgestone Bridge. The next way in marketing all the down here and the throats of all the fans are starting. Perkins. For Perkins, it was win number four and the first with his own team. We had uh, totally uh, knocked the uh, V8 lap record around by a factor of about uh, three seconds and, uh, um, you know, we did everything right. We uh, um, had slick pit stops, uh, good, uh, my co-driver Greg Hansen did an absolutely top job and uh, so no, I was never surprised that we uh, won and uh, we did everything right and others didn't do it as well. The homespun, do it my way racing philosophy of Perkins is a winner with the fans and their devotion is a special part of the Bathurst legend. Even in 87, at the lowest point of Brock's relationship with Holden, he was not forgotten.
With unshakable loyalty, mostly to V8 engines, the fans can occasionally be cruel, as they were to deserving winners Richardson Scaife in 92. I thought Australian race fans had a lot more to go than this. This is bloody disgraceful. I'll keep racing, but I'll tell you what, this is going to remain with me for a long time. You're a pack of assholes. But they can also forgive, and Richo's switch to a Holden V8 has helped ease the pain of his turbocharged win and a spur-of-the-moment victory speech. I think we're probably at Bathurst, we'll always get a bit of a boo probably from now on because of that, but um, I suppose the, the enlightening side of it is the fact that uh, the last, uh, last year I signed a lot of T-shirts uh, that guys had brought down you know, that, 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 with the words on them that I'd said, and uh, it was all taken in good humour and good spirit, and uh, everyone was happy. On the mountain, the fans have developed a deep love of the cars and the men who race them. I've always um, related to uh, the fans on the top of the mountain and, and uh, Australian supporters, I guess, because I am a pretty typical Australian. and. Uh, uh, I go up to uh, see them, I go up to have a beer with them before the race. This fan base and its influence in the marketplace has been a driving force behind Holden's racing program for a quarter of a century. Motorsport here is uniquely homegrown Australian motorsport. It's had its best times when it has been the head-to-head -head Holden Ford V8 motor racing. The punters love it and they're out there with record crowds enjoying fabulous motor racing. We are inextricably linked. Ongoing will be the pursuit of engineering excellence and its link to development and marketing of production vehicles. And motor racing is really the sharp edge of engineering development. And over the years, we've learned a heck of a lot about brakes, about engine cooling, about suspension, about tyres, that have really taught us a lot about how to build uh, mum and dad's average car. When the Monaro GTS 350 and the Falcon GT first did battle at Mount Panorama, speeds were just over 210 kilometres per hour. Now they nudge 270. Lap times have been slashed by a massive 36 seconds. The year 2000 and another chapter in Bathurst race history beckons.